Chapter Five of the Smoke Eaters by Harvey J. O'Higgins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the nature of a hero. He came into Captain Meaghan's office about noon, carrying his turnout of fire hat and rubbers in a bran sack over his shoulder. He wore his cap slanted down on an ear that had been nipped and scarred with fire. He had the face of a veteran from the regular army in the West deep-eyed and lean, as if heat and exposure had tried him out to bone and sinew. He introduced himself briefly. "'I'm Brunton. I've been transferred here.' And the captain was so absorbed in an admiring scrutiny of this unbeautiful recruit that he did not answer. From the tales he had heard of Brunton he had expected a thick-set burly gorilla, and Brunton was tall and loose. His neck rose from his collar as long as the neck of a plucked turkey, and he had a trick of hitching up his chin every now and then, with a nervous twist of that neck, as if his collar pinched him. It was a mannerism that appealed to Meaghan for obscure reasons. It had been the mannerism of a friend of his earlier days, a red-headed daredevil of a boy who had led the gang to which Meaghan had belonged. "'Feelin' all right again?' he asked affably. "'Yes, sir.' Brunton said. "'Feelin' fine. Much doin?' "'No, not much. What kept you late?' Brunton replied vaguely that there had been a delay about his transfer papers. The captain accepted this unsatisfactory explanation without suspicion, and swung around in his swivel desk chair. "'Gallagher'll fix you up when he comes in,' he said. "'You'll find the boys upstairs.' And having waited for Brunton to go out, he drew a cigar from his pocket and presented it to himself with an air of flattered self-congratulation. For Brunton was the popular hero of the whole fire department. He had been only eighteen months in service, but already he had been entered seven times on the roll of merit. He had first distinguished himself, as Meaghan remembered, by climbing up the back of a burning house without a scaling ladder from sill to shutter and from shutter to moulding, to rescue a child from a third-story window. He had made himself famous in the department by diving into the steaming drip of a flooded cellar to bring out a suffocated pipe-man. He had made himself famous with the public by crawling in among the burning timbers of a house that had collapsed, and working there with axe and hand saw for an hour, a stream of water playing on him to keep his clothes from catching fire, until he had released a fireman who had been pinned down in the wreckage. He had been a scout in the Injun Wars, it was said. He could lift the tail of a five-ton truck with his shoulder. He could go down the leader pipe from a burning roof like a guinea's monk. In short, there was nothing that he could not do, if he had not already done it. And Captain Meaghan, thinking over these things, smoked and smiled. He had no misgivings. Latterly he had been receiving all clumsy probationers as recruits. It was a new and grateful compliment to have a Brunton transferred to his roles. He had no suspicions. Brunton had been injured in his last exploit, and had been sent to the Bronx to rest in the comparative quiet of a suburban engine-house. This was his return to active duty, evidently. The captain smoked and smiled. He was still smoking when his lieutenant returned from dinner but the look of complacent satisfaction had left his face, and he was listening impatiently to the shouts of laughter that sounded from the sitting-room upstairs. "'Brunton's here,' he said. "'See what's going on up there.' Lieutenant Gallagher hung up his coat and cap, and went to investigate. The noise stopped at once. He came back with his face divided between a smile and a frown. "'It's just that Brunton,' he reported. "'He's been showing them a trick of swallowing money, and then bringing it up again.' "'Brunton?' Meaghan said, with a surprised scowl. Gallagher laughed apologetically. "'Well, it was Donnelly's fault, I guess. Brunton was doing it to catch Donnelly.' "'Huh!' the captain grunted, mollified. "'Donnelly, was it?' The lieutenant nodded. "'He said Brunton was palming the money and wasn't swallowing it and Brunton stumped him to mark a quarter and give it to him. And he swallowed it all right, but now he says he can't get it up again, and Donnelly's out twenty-five cents. The captain's mouth twitched. Serve him right. Donnelly's been getting too wise round here anyway. He thinks he knows it all. 
Serve em right. He reached for his cap. Give Brunton the bed down by the window and move Donnelly up nearer the pole. He went out for his three hours off duty, being a one-mealer, and Lieutenant Gallagher drew a package of fine cut from his hip pocket, rolled a ball of it between thumb and forefinger, and sat down to chew over his doubts of Brunton. It was evident that the new man was a peculiar genius, as Sergeant Pym, privately interrogated, had confessed. And it was evident, too, that his reputation gave him a prestige among the men that would be powerful for good or evil. Gallagher had tempered old Meaghan's absolutism by allowing the men a degree of liberty in their leisure hours, and a license of unusual freedom during the captain's absence every afternoon, from two o'clock till five. He began to fear that Brunton might lead in an abuse of the company's privileges, and he listened with uneasiness to the growing uproar that began to echo from above stairs. The sallow Donnelly, Long Tom Donnelly, put his head in the door, in the midst of these reflections. "'That man's crazy,' he said. "'He's sitting up there with strips of paper pasted all over his face, and a paper funnel on his nose, making faces at himself.' Gallagher recognized the personal bias of this report, and said nothing. Long Tom shrugged a shoulder and withdrew. Sergeant Pym dropped in, quite casually, a moment later. "'Brunton's a regular goat,' he laughed. "'He's got Long Tom on the run, pretending he's crazy. It's good as a nigger showed up there.' "'Don't let him get too gay, Pym,' the lieutenant said. "'He'll be making trouble for us all with the old man, if he ain't careful.' Pym dutifully smoothed out his grin. Oh, he's all right. It's been pretty slow for him up in the Bronx, I guess. He's feeling his oats, getting back downtown. He's after Donnelly, that's all. Donnelly tried to come the lofty on him, and he wouldn't stand for it. The lieutenant shifted his cud. Tell him to go slow on it, he said, somewhat reassured. Sure, Pym promised. He's all right. The lieutenant rested on that promise until another of the men, on his way out to his dinner, looked in, laughing, to report, "'Brunton's more fun in a cage of kittens,' he said. "'Pim's putting him on to Donnelly, getting back at him for setting the cop wise on that trick he played the kike down the street. He's got Long Tom going for fair.' "'Pim has?' Gallagher said. He knew of the bitterness between Pim and Donnelly. He knew that if Pym saw in Brunton an agent of retaliation, there would be no limit to the fool's play he would instigate. That was the known defect in Pym. He was wise in the affairs of his profession, but outside of them he was as irresponsible and mischievous as a schoolboy. There was nothing now for Gallagher to do but to wait until the men went beyond bounds, and then to repress them with a prompt show of authority. He waited. In the meantime, from sleight of hand and coin-swallowing, Brunton had gone to uproarious foolery. He had badgered the contemptuous Donnelly until Long Tom had gone downstairs in disgust to look after the horses. And he proposed now that he should startle Donnelly by sliding down the hay-chute to him from the storeroom to the ground floor, feet first. His audience did not suppose that he would dare to do it and encouraged him jocularly, until, in the face of Pym's warning that he would either stick in the walls and smother, or drop down the two stories and break his legs, he got into the chute, cried, "'Here goes nothing!' and disappeared. The crazy dare-deviltry of it left the men standing snickering guiltily at one another. "'Gad,' Pym said, "'we'd better get down and get a hearse.' And they swarmed down the sliding-poles after him to the ground floor. They were met by Donnelly, who came running to the stairs with the expression of a man who has seen insanity. Behind him came Brunton, covered with the dust of the chute, his shirt-sleeves torn at the elbows and his fingers cut. "'I'll fix you,' he was saying. "'I'll cut your heart out. Crazy, am I? By cricky, Mike, I'll fix you. Crazy, am I? I'll blow your brains out. By cricky, Mike.' He winked at the men, and went after Donnelly, muttering crazily. And the crew dodged behind the truck, and struggled with the agonies of their unrelieved laughter, bent double, or leaning helplessly against the wall, choking and shaking in silent convulsions. Donnelly burst in on the lieutenant with a sputteringly excited account of the affair, 
and Gallagher heard him out without comment. "'I can't interfere,' the lieutenant said doggedly. "'As soon as he does something against the rules, I can call him down. But I can't until he does. Leave him alone. Keep away from him.' "'Well, I'm trying to keep away from him,' Donnelly protested, "'and he's chasing me all over the place.' The lieutenant took up his newspaper. "'I can't help it,' he repeated. "'You'll have to fix it up between yourselves.' Donnelly went back to his persecution, and it proceeded in a conspiracy of silence which all the men joined. It endured without official notice until Captain Meaghan had returned and the lieutenant was already congratulating himself on the end of the trouble when Donnelly came back in desperation to the office to report that Brunton was threatening to shoot him. "'He's crazy,' he insisted. "'He's crazy. And he's got a gun in his clothes at that. He's crazy!' Captain Meaghan, taken unawares, glared at him in astonishment. Gallagher asked, "'Did you see the gun?' "'You ask Pim!' Donnelly cried. He saw it. He told me. Pim's playing you, I guess, the lieutenant said. The captain found his voice to demand suddenly, Who's crazy? Brunton is, Donnelly answered. Pim told me. Captain Meaghan leaned forward at him, grasping the arms of his chair. You go and mind your own business, see? he said. You're a pinhead. That's all that's wrong with you. You're no good. It'd take a whole crew of you and a battalion chief to make a man like Brunton. You get out of here and shut your holler." Donnelly swallowed and made as if to speak. "'Shut up and get out!' Meaghan ordered, in a voice that fairly blew Long Tom backwards out of the door. "'Blamed yellow cur,' the captain muttered, "'coming round here with a whine like that.' Lieutenant Gallagher did not reply and for the rest of the day Donnelly suffered dumbly an organized persecution that allowed no echo of Brunton's horseplay to reach the office. But at eleven o'clock that night, when peace seemed to have settled down with darkness on the house, and the bunk-room was as quiet as a nursery asleep, and there was not so much as a snore to disturb the dimly lit repose of the hypocrites in their white cots, a shot exploded on the stillness with a stab of flame and a deafening echo. A scream of terror wailed up after it, horribly shrill. A roar of laughter followed in a tremendous guffaw, and rose in the half-light with a volume that shook the walls. The captain's door flew open before a bray of anger. Donnelly, crouching in the aisle between the cots, greeted him with an indignant, "'He's trying to assassinate me!' and the room rang with the haw-haws of the men who could no longer struggle with the convulsions that shook and twisted them as if they had all been taken with fits. Captain Meaghan shouted at them in vain, until the lieutenant turned up the gas-jets on the pandemonium, and the men, surprised by the light, smothered themselves in their pillows and choked down their laughter to a suppressed and spasmodic snorting and grunting. The captain, standing in the doorway in his underclothes, his grey hair tousled from the pillow, swore at them in a wrathful bewilderment. Long Tom Donnelly stammered unintelligibly, and pointed at Brunton. And Brunton, sitting up in his bed, stared in the wildest bewilderment. "'What? What's up?' he asked. At that innocent inquiry, Sergeant Pym rolled out of his bed in his blankets, and writhed helplessly on the floor, drumming with his heels on the linoleum. Brunton looked around at him and blinked. "'Who fired that?' Captain Meaghan cried. "'He did!' Donnelly screamed. "'I seen him! I was watchin' him! He's been threatening. "'Shut up!' Meaghan ordered. He bore down on Brunton with his hands clenched. "'Did you?' Brunton shook his head, open-mouthed. "'No,' he said. "'I was asleep. I—' He looked about him at the men, shaking under their bedclothes. "'What's the matter?' he asked mildly. Sergeant Pym, on the floor, squealed in another spasm, and the men, who had been holding themselves in to listen, went off again into hysterics as if they had been a class of boarding-school girls. Meaghan leaped around at them, with the purple face of a man on the verge of apoplexy, and he was still struggling with an oath that stuck in his throat, when the jigger on the wall clicked and struck. If it had been a cry of fire to a theatre audience roaring at a farce, 
or the warning shot of an outpost to a company of soldiers singing around a campfire, it could not have made a more sudden silence. The men started up on their elbows. The captain stopped with his hand in the air, dropped it, and turned. The bell clanged out its swift strokes, and paused, and the men were out of their beds and kicking into their boots and trousers before it could complete the alarm. Sergeant Pym followed Brunton down the sliding pole and leaped with him to the truck. "'Where'd you get the gun?' the sergeant asked out of the corner of his mouth. Brunton leaned over to answer behind his hand. "'Up in the Bronx. I had to carry one. Dunk Cooper's gang was after me.' Pym whispered, "'What did you do with it?' Brunton winked and laughed. "'I got it here.' And while they were still laughing, the catastrophe began to develop. On account of the disorder in the bunk-room, and the consequent unreadiness of the men to respond to the alarm, the man on watch had been left unaided to lock the collars and hook the bit-snaps of the three horses as they charged down on him from their stalls. And while he had been still struggling with the last of them, Long Tom Donnelly had sprung into the driver's seat, so excited that he did not wait for the word of command before he jerked on the reins, brought down the harness on the horses' backs, and started them out. The watchman had time only to jump aside from their heads. He had not time to make sure that the doors had been slid back to the walls, and the hub of a front wheel struck an edge strip that was projecting from the door frame and smashed through the heavy timber with a noise that frightened the horses and a shock that almost threw Captain Meaghan from his place on the turntable. He shouted at Donnelly and confused him the more, and the truck, turning too sharply, swung its rear wheels wide over the sidewalk and dropped them with a jolt from the curbstone to the gutter. Brunton grunted, "'Swerse and ridin' strip saddle!' He tightened his belt. In a few moments he added, lickety split, Cricky Mike, for the horses were leaping along in a furious gallop. He leaned out from the side step to see the off horse plunging ahead. He heard Megan cry, Hold him in, hold him in. Donnelly answered through his teeth, Something's loose. They spun past a corner light with all the men craning their necks to see. Captain Megan shouted, Hell, that bit ain't snapped. The center horse. The truck began to swing dangerously from side to side. Lieutenant Gallagher turned to the men. "'Look out now, boys,' he said. "'What's the matter?' Brunton asked him. The sergeant answered, "'They're off. They be in the lead. Her bit ain't snapped.' The three horses, running wild, were pounding out the confused clatter of a stampede over asphalt and paving stones, instead of that regular pulse of hoofbeats which times the speed of a well-reined gallop. Donnelly, braced and straining, clung to the lines, but the pull was all against him, and the great animals jerked and tore at his arms as they rose and fell. He was being dragged, not they driven, and they were dragging him straight for the waterfront down a sloping street so narrow that it was impossible, going at such speed, to turn a corner from it. The captain reached forward and hooked the leather strap that held Donnelly to the seat. "'Get both feet on the brakes,' he said. "'Hang on to them!' Long Tom did not need the order. He was bent forward, bareheaded, his face set to the rush of air. He was as cool now as a railroad engineer watching the tracks ahead but the brakes were useless to stop a ten-thousand-pound truck running on ball-bearings behind three deep-chested, mighty-flanked fire-horses gone mad together. They shot past the pillars of an elevated road, and the truck took the car-tracks with the bound of a toboggan. Another electric light whipped past them. The shadows of another dark street leaped to swallow them like the mouth of a tunnel, and there were only two more streets between them and the piers. Captain Meaghan pushed back his helmet from his forehead, and looked around at his lieutenant, as if hoping for the suggestion of some aid, and he saw Brunton swing nimbly up from the step to the other side of the turntable, and peer out at the horses. "'What are you doing?' Meaghan called. His voice was lost in that clang and roar, and rattle of jolting wheels and ringing pavement, and clamouring bell. Brunton did not notice him, but dropped his head into his shoulders like a cat, and went forward around the turntable until he was crouched at Donnelly's knee. 
he jumped forward and disappeared. The captain turned to catch up a lantern, but a lurch of the truck almost threw him from his hold, and he could only cling helplessly to the iron upright and wait for a corner light. As one flashed by, it showed Brunton astride of the off-horse, working forward to its shoulders. Before the darkness closed again, he had reached its mane and stretched himself out along its neck to catch the bridle of the middle horse. Captain Meaghan understood that he was trying to pull its head around and throw it, as a cavalryman throws his mount. But he understood also that this was the sixteen-hundred-pound filly of a mixed-blood Percheron mare and as strong in the neck as a bull. And Brunton had not even the purchase of a bit to aid him. When the feeble gaslights of half the block had flowed past, without any slackening of speed, Meaghan gave up hope. "'He can't do it,' he groaned. "'Run him into something, Tom.' Before Donnelly could answer, there was a flash of fire at the horses' heads, and a shot rang out above the noises of hoof and wheel. A second report cut the echo of the first. The middle horse leaped and fell kicking. It was dragged between the poles on the asphalt until it brought down the nigh horse. The truck swept them forward in a struggling heap with broken poles and snapped harness until the third horse fell too. And then the front wheels jammed into them and stopped the truck with a lurch that shot Meaghan forward as he leaped. He lit on his feet and ran to the poles. "'Bring a light!' he cried, forcing down the head of the struggling nigh-horse with his knee. "'Brunton!' he said hoarsely. "'Brunton!' There was no answer. Lieutenant Gallagher and the men ran up with lanterns. "'Loose those flank horses!' Meaghan cried. "'He must be in underneath!' The men began to unbuckle the tangled straps. "'Cut them! Cut them!' he ordered. He reached down to raise the head of the bleeding animal that Brunton had shot. Lieutenant Gallagher touched him on the shoulder. "'Brunton's over there, on the curb, he said, and Meaghan turned to see the missing fireman sitting beside the gutter, painfully nursing a bruised shoulder. It was plain from Brunton's expression that he was pretending to be more hurt than he really was, and below his exaggerated grimace of pain there was a sheepish look of guilt. Captain Meaghan stared in surprise and bewilderment, and then he remembered that forgotten incident in the truck-house, and he understood Brunton's expression, and his face changed. He drew a long breath. In the silence one of the men snickered hysterically. Meaghan shouted at Brunton, "'You're a liar! You fired that in the bunk-room!' and threw up his hands and swung a passionate kick into a lantern that stood at his feet. It rose flaming, fell with a crash of broken glass, and went out. In the darkness the men heard his profanity choke in his throat. He coughed. He said in a moment, "'Fix those horses and let's get out of here!' Three hours later the men had returned to their quarters, a very dark and solemn crew. Captain Meaghan had not spoken a word to them. He had gone upstairs to his office without even stopping to look at the two lamed horses or to examine the truck, and when Gallagher followed him twenty minutes afterward, he found him sitting dumb before his open journal, a dry pen in his hand, and the lid of the inkwell still unlifted. Gallagher waited. Meaghan did not move. "'Better leave that till the morning, I guess, sir,' the lieutenant said. Meaghan reached out quickly, dipped his pen, and drew a shaky black line through Brunton's name on the roll. "'Brunton goes back to the goose-pastures,' he growled. "'Take Donnelly off the seat and put him on the tiller again.' Gallagher waited. "'What about Pym?' Meaghan swung around to him. "'Pym? What's he got to do with it?' Gallagher said. "'His monkey shinin's at the bottom of the whole thing. I know he didn't mean any harm, but he started Brunton going in the first place.' Meaghan threw down his pen. "'Well, darn my eyes!' he cried. "'I'm captain of a crew of fools. I'm up against it.' There was a suspiciously timed tap at the door, and Gallagher opened it to find the shamefaced Pym standing on the threshold. "'Well,' Meaghan growled. The sergeant took off his cap and slunk in guiltily. "'Captain,' he said, if there's going to be any trouble about this thing, I want to take my share of it. I—' "'You get out of here,' Meaghan ordered. 
You're the blank, blank, fool that didn't know it was loaded. I'll lose my job through you some of these days, Pim. But it's no good talking. You're too old to get sense. Go on. Go to bed. Pim nodded solemnly. That's right, Captain. That'll hold me for a while. That's right. I'm a blank old fool. I'm a blank old blank blank. That's right. He went out abusing himself vilely. Good night, he said, and shut the door. Captain Meaghan put an unlighted cigar in his mouth, rolled it over between his lips, and shook his head blankly. That's the second time, he said. That's the second time I've been up against a man that wasn't scared of nothing. And they don't do. They don't do. I might have knowed Brunton couldn't have done the things he's done and have good sense. I might have knowed it. These here heroes, he shut his journal with a bang, I don't want no more of them. They're no good. They're no blank good. End of chapter 5「Six of the Smoke Eaters by Harvey J. O'Higgins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Corrigan's Promotion Corrigan had been the motorman of a metropolitan electric car, and he had been discharged from the service of the street railway company for wrecking his trolley in a collision with a fire engine. He had felt that the fire department owed him a living, having deprived him of one and the political influence of his brother-in-law helped the commissioner to pay the debt. The railway thereby lost a motorman who could run down a crowded street with a controller full ahead, and who cracked his gongs frequently by dancing frantic fandangos on the ringers of them when the heavy goods trucks got on his tracks. And the department gained a probationer who loved excitement as a collie dog loves an open field, who could handle a forty-pound scaling ladder from the shoulder, with the muscles that had skidded car wheels when he screwed down brakes, and who went up a windowed wall or took the thirty-five foot jump into the life net in probationers' drills at headquarters, with the smile of the days when he had played cops and crooks through an east side lumber yard. His term of probation was all pure sport for him. He spent his days at headquarters and his nights at the engine house in Harlem, to which he had been previously assigned. He worked off ten pounds of fat, and he clipped his drooping black moustache until it stood out in a fierce bristle under his huge beak of a nose. His comrades called him Bull, and he pawed at them in a bear-cub playfulness that left them bruised about the forearms. He was happy. He had but one cause of dissatisfaction. The Harlem Engine House was not a school of arduous training, and he wished for a more exciting life. He saw a prospect of it when he received his appointment as a fourth-grade fireman detailed to fill a vacancy in Captain Meaghan's command. And he chewed the roots of his moustache with one corner of his mouth, and smiled crookedly out of the other. "'You'll straighten your mug before you've finished with that,' they warned him. He straightened it forthwith, in a grin that curled evenly on both sides of his nose. "'I guess you're right, all right,' he said, and nodded. He reported for duty on the following day, and Captain Meaghan looked him over with an official glare. He saluted clumsily and stood stiff, knowing the captain by reputation as a gruff disciplinarian. Meaghan said, "'How much do you weigh?' "'One ninety, sir,' Corrigan answered. He groaned. "'One ninety? Do you know that truck weighs near ten thousand pounds already?' Corrigan regarded the hook-and-ladder truck aggrievedly. He had never considered the weight of a truck before, but it struck him that this one had gone to gross excess. One ninety, Meaghan snorted. I suppose they think I'm running an ox-cart. Some of you'll have to get out and walk pretty soon. This was evidently sarcasm. Corrigan smiled at it with uneasiness. Meaghan demanded, What did they send you here for? I didn't ask, Corrigan answered simply. The captain eyed him with suspicion. Well, he said, you carry a good hook, don't you? Corrigan squinted down his nose and reddened. A regular tin-cutter, Meaghan snarled. A regular can-opener. I guess that's why they sent you, eh? 
Thought you'd be good at making smoke vents in a tin roof, eh? Cargan muttered an unintelligible answer at his feet. Well, the captain concluded savagely, we'll soon smoke the shine off it for ye. He turned to his lieutenant. Here, Gallagher, show this man his quarters. You'll go on the bright work. Do you understand? Cargan understood that he was to have the care of shining brass, of the sliding poles and the truck. He said, I do, and followed the lieutenant upstairs with an angry swing of the shoulders that would have meant a fight under other circumstances. That was his introduction to Captain Meaghan. There followed his meeting with the men of the company, a meeting that was a clumsy ceremony of handshakes and embarrassed gutturals. He was shown his cot in the bunk-room and given the key of the closet for his clothes, and then he was left to shift for himself. He proceeded to inspect with due reverence the truck's equipment of ladders, hooks, and axes, shovels, picks, wrenches, mauls, bars, jimmies, forks, pipes, hand-lamps, respirators, battering-rams, and what not. He arranged his helmet and his turn-out coat in the row of them on the bed-ladders. He inquired for and located the cloth and chemical for polishing his bright work. He studied the list of fire-alarms, patted the horses, and smiled ingratiatingly at the jigger over the desk. It did not reply with an immediate signal, and he went upstairs again with an undiscouraged grin to wait for it. Within an hour it was known to every member of the company that the new man played a poorer game of checkers than Billy Parr, even, who had a fatal weakness for leading from the double corner, and that was the beginning of Corrigan's popularity with the blue shirts. Meaghan saw nothing in him except a hulking good nature which might easily be mistaken for the next of kin to stupidity. Corrigan lay awake the greater part of that night, listening in an excess of zeal for a fire alarm that was not rung in. In the morning he was heavy-lidded at roll-call, and the captain remarked it. A summons to a small fire that was black when the truck arrived on the scene of it brought Corrigan the last man to his place on the sidestep, and that was another mark against him. He made a good record when Taps called the crew to their places at midday, but he closed his eyes while he was at watch on the desk in the afternoon, and the captain accused him of being asleep there. Corrigan did not argue, but he did worse. He sulked. And by the time he had turned in for the night, he was discouraged, angry, and plainly marked for the captain's displeasure. He fell asleep with the small flame of the gas bracket in the wall above him, burning an irritation in his eyes. The jigger exploded its alarm. The lights swam in his head as he sprang from his bed and struggled into his trousers and high boots, drunk with sleep. He dropped down the pole to the main floor as if falling in a dream and staggered to catch the side-step of the truck as it rolled out into the street in a dull rumble of pounding hoofs and thick voices. A rush of the night air puffed into his face with the wet smell of a draught from a cellar, and began to sing hollow in his ears like the croon in a shell, so that the ride that followed seemed as confused as a nightmare, the three horses straining in their collars, the blown lights of the driver's lamps shining on the play of muscles in their sleek flanks, the bell ding-donging monotonously, and the silent men beside him on the step swaying as they finished their dressing, clinging to the side ladders of the jolting truck. His own hands did not seem to belong to him. They were at a great distance from him, on the ends of long arms. His helmet did not fit his head. He got one arm into his rubber coat, but the other could not find a second sleeve, and he was still fumbling for an armhole when the truck swung around a corner and he came on a street of smoke and fire engines and the hoarse bellowings of battalion chiefs and company foremen. He looked up from this turmoil to see smoke puffing from the middle windows of a five-story building that seemed immeasurably high in the darkness and the deceptive play of light. His eye was caught by a glare of flames shining on the glasses of a window. The panes brightened and burst, clinking on the stone sills. And then a stream of water struck up to overwhelm this sudden brilliance in a cloud of smoke and steam. A rough hand caught the coat from him and swung him around. 
he heard Lieutenant Gallagher cry out, "'You won't need that!' Someone thrust a bar of cold metal into his bewildered clutch and shoved him forward. He came to himself to find that he was stumbling across the cobblestones with a steel tool in his hand. His head cleared. He drew a long breath. The men of Company No. 0 were battering at the doors of the building adjoining that which was afire, and he could see that both were wholesale clothing houses from their signboards. Both, too, were old. He knew that they would be dry and unsafe and he knew that his crew had been ordered to make smoke vents in the roof. Then the door fell open, the crew disappeared in the doorway, and he followed at full tilt to blunder up the stairs behind a hand-lamp that shone in the darkness ahead of him. Smoke smarted in his eyes and burned in his nostrils. There was someone behind him hurrying him forward. He took the endless steps three at a bound and raced along the hallways and what with the excitement and the pleasure he took in it, his heartbeat seemed to lift him from his feet. He clambered, panting, up the ladder, through the scuttle, leaped a dividing parapet between the buildings, and attacked the tin roof with an eager jab of his tool. Around him, axe and hook and cutter, tore and stripped and splintered tin and rafters and the glass and sash of skylights, till the smoke began to curl upwards out of gaping holes in the roof and the men pushed back their helmets from their foreheads, and wiped the sweat from their eyes. Captain Meaghan was shouting orders at them from the top of the cornice, where he stood to watch the crew in the street below. They depended on him to warn them of danger from whatever direction they might be menaced, and they worked with as little apparent apprehension for their safety as farm labourers digging in a field. At Meaghan's command a ladder was dragged over the parapet and lowered into the skylight, and Gallagher and three men slid down it. Corrigan stood, listening alertly, with his eye on his captain, as eager as a hound. He heard the windows of the floor beneath crash into the street. A draught of evil-smelling smoke drew up through the vents. "'Mighty thick down there,' someone behind him said and without turning he nodded as if the remark had been addressed to him. He watched Captain Meaghan lean over the cornice and bawl directions to Gallagher in the lower windows. He heard the answer come up thin and faint from below. There were anxious calls and answers across the roof, and he understood that one of Gallagher's men had been lost in the smoke. Meaghan hurried a rescuing party down the ladder, and Corrigan remained to chew at his moustache. When these men returned with Gallagher's missing fireman and laid him on the roof, three of the crew fanned him with their helmets while Corrigan and the others, at Meaghan's orders, raised the ladder from the skylight and carried it over to the cornice where the captain stood. They lowered it over the front of the building till it hung by its hooks, and Lieutenant Gallagher and the other two men, with red and watering eyes, climbed up it from the windows and hauled it up after them. The captain turned from conversation with them to order Long Tom Donnelly to report that the roof was open and that the fire was creeping along the floor below. "'Hurry em up! Hurry em up!' he shouted after him, and Corrigan felt a prickly heat of impatience strike up from the warm roof under his feet. There was an explosion that shook the building, and he recognized it as the puff of the backdraft. "'Just missed it!' Lieutenant Gallagher said to little Fuchs. Fuchs wiped a wide grin with the back of his hand, and Corrigan smiled in sympathy. The sparks began to swirl up in the smoke from the vents. Captain Meaghan, cursing the engine companies, cried, "'Gallagher! Take half the men and report below. We're doing no good here!' Corrigan watched the lieutenant with a wistful eye, but Gallagher did not see. He signalled with a wave of the hand to four of the men who stood together near the cornice, and they trailed after him nonchalantly. Corrigan swallowed a lump of disappointment in his throat, and shifted on his feet. They stood leaning on their tools, while the smoke reddened with the growth of the flames beneath it. And to Corrigan it seemed as slow to watch as the sunrise that had used to end his night of duty on the platform of his trolley-car. It was an interminable interval of inaction. He patted his heel on the tin as if on the ringer of a gong. "'Hell!' Meaghan cried. 
Corrigan growled in unconscious echo of him. Hell! Meaghan wheeled on him, and then, at last, there was the sound of voices from the neighbouring roof, and they looked to see a pipe-man lifting the nozzle of an empty hose from the scuttle there. Corrigan ran with the others to help, and they drew the hose from the trap in the roof till it stretched like an angle-worm, plucked from a clod. There was a shout of orders given, and repeated, a breathless pause, and then the line swelled with the rush of water and spat its stream into the raw wound of tin and wood. Corrigan shook the spray from his eyes and ran laughing to lighten up the heavy line, pulling and lifting the pulsing body of the hose from the scuttle, and carrying it across the roof as gently as if he were afraid a rough hand would break it. And when he reached the skylight where the fire had showed, he found the smoke black, the top of a ladder pointing up from it, and the last of the pipemen disappearing in the cloud. Following the best traditions of the department, they had gone to fight the fire from the inside. Captain Meaghan cried, "'Well, boys, there's nothing more to do here but the washin' down. Better get below again.' Corrigan looked up to the sudden realization that the fun was over. It had only just begun, and already it was over for him. He blinked up at the clear moonlit sky that showed through the drift of smoke, filling his burning eyes with the cooling light. The men were carrying their tools and ladders across the roof to take them below. He turned to follow them reluctantly. But the pounding on the roof, the shock of the back-draft, and the running to and fro of the heavy crew had had an effect on the old timbers that had not been reckoned with. A beam cracked like the report of a pistol. The captain turned with an oath of alarm. Corrigan, looking back over his shoulder, saw the great water-tank that had been supported across the lower angle of the parapet fall in the tremor of a crackling earthquake that sunk the weakened roof under his feet like the deck of a rolling ship. He sprang for the parapet and leaped upon it as his footing gave way beneath him. The rush of water hissed above the snapping of the timbers. He heard the men cry out in horror, and he turned to find a dead silence broken by a low groan from the wreckage hidden in the smoke. The three pipemen, who had gone down the skylight ladder, were imprisoned there. All the truck men had escaped. There was no confusion. Captain Meaghan called out his orders quickly and coolly, to one to report to the chief, to another to lead up another line of hose, to a third to bring the lifelines from the truck to a fourth to warn the men below that the whole weight of the roof rested now on a floor that was already burning. But Corrigan did not wait for any orders. He had turned, with the instinct of the undrilled, to make an individual effort to save the men who would be slowly roasted between burning floor and burning roof. Snatching an axe from the nearest hand, he ran along the parapet to the cornice, and began to creep down the incline of the tin roofing into the smoke. He heard the captain shout, "'Back there, you! Three's enough!' And then the smoke blew over him in a wave that blinded him, and choked him, and seemed even to fill his ears, so that he heard nothing more. The tin sheathing grew hot under his hands. His throat seemed to contract convulsively, so that he could not breathe. He crawled forward desperately, and the slope steepened, and he pitched headlong, sliding on his stomach. A groan sounded in the pit ahead of him. He turned to get feet foremost, thrust himself forward, and slid down on heels and elbows, clinging to his axe. He dropped over a rough edge of tin that cut his hands. His feet struck something soft among the timbers, and he knew, from the moan that answered, that he had found one of the men. What followed was never clear afterwards in his memory. He was like a drowning man held below water in an entanglement of wreckage, gasping and suffocating, and fighting in the darkness to get himself free. He found that the piped man lay unconscious with a leg caught under a beam, and when he struggled to raise the beam the man made a dry clucking in his mouth like a child in a fever. Corrigan got his great hands under the joist and strained in vain to raise the broken end of it till the cords in his back pained at their roots. Then he fell on it furiously with his axe, his head swimming, 
and the blows cut into the timber with a sound that grew fainter and fainter to him so that they seemed like the strokes of a lumberman's axe in the woods at a distance he was growing sick and weak with the heat the axe became so heavy that he could hardly lift it his knees began to loosen and then there was the roar of a whirlpool in his head and he sank on his face and fainted meanwhile captain meaghan on the parapet of the adjoining roof alternately cursed corrigan the unfortunate pipe men the roof the fire and his own keen eyes that had failed to note the insecurity of the water tank he stamped on the ledge like a sailor on his deck and the language he used was from the deep seas he had given his orders there was nothing to do now but to wait and it was a thing which meaghan had never learned to do when gallagher returned with the lifelines the captain flung himself on the lieutenant and snatched the lines from him he tied one quickly under his arms attached the other to his wrist and ordered the men to lower him to corrigan they braced themselves for his weight he threw a leg over the parapet hurry up there he shouted to the pipemen appearing with the hose hurry up there train her on the blaze in the middle all right lower away a shower of water from above revived corrigan in the smoking debris his helmet had fallen off and the cool stream poured on his head he struggled to his feet hating the smoke and the heat with the personal hatred of a soldier for the enemy who has wounded him he fell on the obstinate joist with empty hands you would would you he kept muttering you would would you fighting with the beam in his madness until his hands were numb with bruises and then he straightened up and threw himself at it in a frenzy and his huge bulk came down like a sack of sand on the end of it and finished the work his axe had begun the rest was a delirium years of a delirium in which he finally got the pipe man free and passed him to captain meaghan who appeared through the smoke from nowhere and tied a rope around him and stood him up despite his protests the roof fell from his feet and he seemed to soar up miles struggling he thought he had been tied to a balloon and he was talking foolishness when the men lifted him over the parapet and laid him on the roof he was saved and he had saved the only pipe man who escaped the floor had fallen with the others just as aid had come but he knew nothing of all that until the following day when he found himself lying on his back between the cool sheets of a hospital cot and passed his bandaged hands over the bandages on his face he heard lieutenant gallagher say he's all right a bit singed i guess how are his eyes a strange voice answered we'll know to-morrow corrigan said weakly they're all right i can see down here and laid his hand on the side of his nose where there was a glimmer of light below the dressings the lieutenant laughed couldn't bandage over that nose be quiet now we want you back to the house as soon as you get on your feet the chief's promoted you corrigan tried to understand what he meant but the pain in his head prevented him he asked where'd you get the balloon they called him balloon at the house when he reported for duty two weeks later but he had entered on the roll of merit and his pay had been increased and his name was large in the land captain meaghan scowled at him in a fierce congratulation you should have waited for orders corrigan he said gruffly yes sir he apologized i didn't know no harm done meaghan said you'll be on the ladder committee there's another man on the bright work end of chapter six Chapter Seven, Part One of the Smoke Eaters by Harvey J. O'Higgins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Training Sally Waters, Part One. The crew had finished their committee work, had groomed the horses, swept the main floor, brightened harness, brass, and steel work, and washed, oiled, and polished the big truck till it shone like a gigantic toy sergeant pym was in the sitting-room above stairs with three of the company stretching his legs under a game of poker and when he was not growling at a luck which duplicated his discard always in his draw 
he was calling out sarcasms at young waters for the dust he was raising in sweeping the sitting-room floor as the merry andrew of the company pym alternated between fits of clownishness in which he sacrificed all dignity for laughter and fits of a sour wit in which he endeavoured to regain what he had lost by punishing familiarity as insolence and flaying an innocent victim as a peace-offering to his self-respect waters had been such a victim of such a mood but as the freshman of the crew he had been silent under the hazing he had endured it for two days and even now as long as pym contented himself with such remarks as sally you ought to've been a white wings your style o sweepin ain't indoor sweepin it's broadway in a forty-mile breeze waters continued to work without more than frowning at the laughter of the men but when Pym lost on a call to show cards, spat contemptuously, and called out, Waters! What a name to squirt on a fire! The recruit wheeled on him, and retorted hoarsely, What's the matter with Pym for a name? Pym did not look up from his dealing of the cards. Pym? he repeated cheerfully. Well, there's just one or two things the matter with Pym, Sally. Pym's no name for corner saloon politics and this was a reference to Dry Dime Dolan, an uncle of Waters, and a ward politician whose influence, according to the gossip of the truck-house, had pushed Waters into the department. Waters leaned on his broom and knit his level eyebrows in a glare at Pym. The sergeant regarded his hand of cards. The men about him were in a broad grin. "'Firemen are like the aristocracy for ancestors these days,' Pym said, only it ain't a grandfather it's an uncle waters broke at him with an oath you blank old barnacle he cried you ought to've been scraped out of here long ago you're too blank ignorant to get a promotion yourself and because you can't get along you're sore on any one else that does pym replied it's slow climbin when the ladder's full and the probationers are goin up the back stairs Waters threw down his broom and struck the table with his clenched fist. "'By God!' he screamed, in a young man's cracked voice of wrath. "'I'll go up your ladder over your shoulders. Wait, and I'll put my heel between your teeth when I get up, you old black number, you spavined old cripple, you!' Pym smiled. "'Well, well,' he said. "'Will you now? Whiskey's a power in the land, sure enough.' they say some third avenue brands'll put out a fire the saloon of dry dime dolan was on third avenue but waters did not answer he stood with the echo of his own high voice in his ears staring at the face of a fireman in whose shamed and pitying smile he read that he had made himself ridiculous he turned with a growl of profanity kicked his broom into a corner and went below stairs, his mouth set in an ugly snarl of anger. The other men at the table had learned the wisdom of the truck-house maxim, never but into an argument until it's a fight, and they had sat through the quarrel without a word. Even now only Billy Parr dared to remonstrate with Pym. "'What's the matter, Jim?' he asked mildly. "'What have you got against the youngster?' "'Me?' Pym said got against him why bless my eyes i got nothing against him i knew his dad in the days when we were six-year-olds and just to help the old goosenecks paint the fires green down the bowery he's all right if he's got any of his old man in him but he's got to learn that he ain't any better for being a grafter neither and he's got to learn it before he'll be any good in this crew at that you leave sally and me alone we're conducting a select school of instruction for one parr however did not leave waters and him alone he remonstrated with waters privately what's eatin ye anyway he said pym don't mean any harm it's just his way is it waters replied well he'll learn a new way before i'm done with him i'll make him eat dirt for poundin me the way he's been doin he walked away with his chin up Parr went back to Pym. "'Look here, now, Jim,' he said. "'You leave Waters alone. You take my advice and leave Waters alone.' Pym laughed. "'What's the matter now?' Parr answered solemnly. 
That's all right. I'm givin' you a straight tip. You leave Waters alone. Well, say, Pim protested, what's the use of you comin' round here with a holler like this? It ain't me that's worryin' Waters. He's been goin' round here talkin' politics like a cart-tail spellbinder, until— It ain't my fault if he's an unlicked cub, is it? Tain't my fault. Look here now, Jim, Parr said, confidentially. Waters got a pull. There ain't no sense putting yourself up against it this way. Leave him alone. Pim reached out an emphatic fist and wagged his thumb, with a double-jointed jerkiness under Parr's nose. Look here now, Billy, he mocked him. When I play spaniel and wag my tail so, every time I see a grafter, whistle to me and I'll come. He turned on his heel with that and went downstairs to his stretch of desk duty. His bad mood persisted. Sitting there, beneath the jigger, he tattooed thoughtfully on the blotter and chewed his cud of bitterness. He had come to the department twenty years before, because he needed a regular salary to support his wife. In his third year he had distinguished himself at a fire by saving the lives of two women. He had hoped for an immediate recognition of his services, but he had been approached by the henchman of a ward politician with an itching palm. He had refused to grease the wheels, and the result had been that he had been placed on the roll of merit for saving life, without personal risk. There the recognition had ended. He had been marked as a man not in favour with the powers, and he had climbed up the grades from eight hundred dollars a year to fourteen hundred, slowly and obscurely. Now he was still a blue shirt, a sergeant by courtesy of the department's rules, but with no outlook. The tide of promotion had swept by and left him stranded. He was old enough to be a battalion chief, but too old to become a lieutenant. Add to all this that he had not the textbook learning necessary to pass a civil service examination, even if he were recommended for promotion. That ambition was dead in him. Waters had called him a barnacle. Well, Waters, he told himself, was probably right. He had but one consolation. He had been independent. He had paid no blackmail to the ring. He had never cringed to his superiors. And though he had played the fool among the men, it was because he was vain of his natural wit and his pride lived on laughter. He wrote again and again on a blank sheet of paper, J. Pym, with the J superimposed on the P, to make Jim Pym and he looked at himself in that name and saw himself a failure, an odd character of a comic fame in his company, but beyond all hope of promotion. Jim Pym. A man in an apron running in from the street caught at his waist on the chain that hung across the doorway and cried, There's a fire! Say, there's a big fire down the street! Waving his hand wildly toward the waterfront, Men came running out from behind the apparatus. Pym put his head out the door and saw a light smoke far down at the foot of the street. The man shouted in his ear, That's it! Pym thrust him back from the doorway, slipped the catch on the chain, and turned to sound a still alarm on the electric button below the gong. The three horses burst from their stalls with hoofs thudding on the planks. Before they had reached their places, Waters and the firemen from the sitting-room had hit the floor. By the time Pym and Gallagher had backed the horses into position, the driver, in his seat, had released the harness with a jerk on the reins. Captain Meaghan cried from the sidewalk, "'All right!' The horses strained against their collars, and Pym caught the step of the truck as the wheels scraped past his toes. When he got his helmet on his head, he glanced at Waters, who was on the other side of the truck, and saw him excitedly fighting his way into his turnout coat. Pym smiled. I've put a bat in his belfry, he thought. When they drew near the fire, he recognized the burning building as one of the few tenements left in that district between the waterfront street of sailors' boarding houses and the warehouses that had crowded them out. He saw also that the alarm had come in late, for the smoke was now pouring out of all the windows of the third floor, and the occupants of the upper stories were throwing pans, bedding, and furniture into the street. 
A crowd had gathered at a safe distance to laugh and enjoy the excitement. Lieutenant Gallagher turned to Pym. "'Send in an alarm,' he ordered, and Pym dropped from the step at a street corner to run for a firebox a block away. He doubled back on a steady lope with a policeman lumbering along behind him. The arrival of the company had drawn a crowd that blocked the street. He shouldered his way through them, caught up an axe from the truck, and darted into the doorway of the burning house. He met the crew pouring down from the upper landing. "'Whole floor's afire,' the first man told him. He turned back with them. The police had cleared the sidewalk. The rain of bedding from above had ceased. The women who had been throwing it out had found that the fire had cut them off from the stairs, and they leaned out the windows, screaming and weeping hysterically. One fat Italian matron had straddled the sill. She kicked at the wall with a shoeless foot as if she were going to jump. Captain Meaghan roared at her. "'Damn you! You jump down here, and I'll have you put in the lock-up!' She gaped, silenced. He cried to the squad of men with whom Waters was standing. "'Get up there with your ladders,' he called to his lieutenant. "'Gallagher, open up the roof. Take ropes with you.' Gallagher snapped his fingers at Pym, Parr, and two of the other men. They buckled on their life-belts, picked out a coil of line and a light ladder, took axes, hooks, and crowbars, and disappeared in the door of the adjoining house just as Waters caught the hook of his scaling-ladder on the sill of the first-story window and went up the pole of it nimbly. Captain Meaghan said, "'Steady there!' Waters straddled the sill of the first window, with his left leg in the room, turned the hook of the ladder out from him, raised the forty-pounder with a sure arm, his hands far apart, his left hand uppermost to steady the weight, and put the hook in the second-story window with the precision of a timed drill. The hook of the ladder below him touched his toes as he stood up. "'Good enough,' Captain Meaghan said. "'Good enough. Steady there!' Waters had the top of his ladder in the smoke of the third-story window before the man who was following him had fairly gripped his sill with his knees. "'Shake yourself there,' Meaghan called to the ladder. "'Don't let your leader get away from you like that. Who is that first man?' he asked the remainder of the squad. "'Waters,' they said. Waters was sitting in the belch from the third-story window. He called down something unintelligible. "'Go up! Go up!' Meaghan ordered. Waters went up. The head of his ladder rose steadily along the red brick wall until the fat Italian woman caught it at arm's length. She shook it and yelled. Meaghan bellowed, "'Hi! You! Drop that!' She attempted to put her foot on it, and in doing so she released her hold. Waters wrenched the ladder free, jabbed it up with both hands, and struck her with the hook with such force that she fell back into the room. Before she could get righted, he was in the window. She attempted to throw her arms about him. He held her back with a hand at her throat, and she fought like a drowning woman. Captain Meaghan, stamping in the gutter, bawled, "'Good enough! Good enough! Get her down now, boys! All up there! All up!' The chain of ladders was completed from the ground to Waters, and the men clambered up to their stations. Waters caught the frantic woman about the waist, and despite the stranglehold she took of his neck, despite her screams and her kicking, and despite her two hundred pounds, he got her down to the man below him with the loss only of his helmet, which she knocked off when he closed with her. She was passed down from man to man, struggling more and more feebly as she descended, flapping in her voluminous and fluttering skirts. She collapsed breathless on the sidewalk. Waters went back for the next woman, who came quietly. The smoke was thickening from the third-story window, so that the man below Waters had to go down beneath it and take his station there. As the last woman was passed down, her dress caught fire in a spurt of flame, and the firemen beat it out with their hands. Waters went back to the fourth-story window. He climbed in through it. A fire-engine came blowing shrilly down the street, with its tender turning the corner behind it. They were slow enough, Captain Meaghan growled. He was watching the edge of the roof for Gallagher. Get your thirty-five-foot ladders up, 
he ordered his squad, and they began to get out the heavy ladders to carry the lines of hose. He watched the roof for Gallagher's squad. He heard the blows of axes on a scuttle and the crash of glass in a skylight. Then Pym appeared on the cornice with a line in his hand, and looked down at the flame below him. A puff of smoke burst from the fourth-story window through which Waters had entered. Captain Meaghan waved to Pym to get his line over the cornice. "'There's a man in there!' he shouted. "'Waters!' Pym ran back to tie his rope. Gallagher and the others of the squad, who had been making smoke vents in the roof, had found that the fire was fierce in the rear of the building, where both the third and fourth stories were ablaze. When they got the scuttle off, the smoke rose in a great woof. It was impossible to descend into it. They turned at Pym's shout from the cornice and ran to help him loop the lifeline to a chimney. "'Waters is in down there,' he said. "'He's cut off. We'll have to haul him up, darn fool!' He took several turns of the rope around the shaft of the snap-hook on his life-belt, dropped over the cornice with the slack of the rope drawn over his thigh, and slid down deftly to the window. "'I put a bat in his belfry all right, all right,' he was muttering. He lifted Waters' scaling ladder from the sill and raised it to catch on the cornice. Then, having released himself from the rope, he groped his way into the hot smoke of the room and stumbled against a table. He edged around it and kicked a rocking chair. He dropped to his hands and knees and crept forward with his face to the floor to catch whatever air there might be along the oilcloth. He heard a groan. He lay flat and listened. It was repeated ahead of him, to the right. He scuttled across quickly in that direction and bumped his helmet against a closed door, the hall door, as he guessed, from the location of the stairway. He rattled the knob. The door was locked with a latch-lock but the latch was on his side. He pulled it open and fell back from a burst of flame. There was someone lying on the floor against the balustrade of the stairway. He turned the leaf of his helmet over his face, darted into the heat, and heard the forgotten door click shut behind him. He understood then how Waters had been trapped. There was a spring hinge on the door. It was locked. He kicked furiously at the panels, holding his breath against a heat that seared his eyes and cracked his lips, that dried his body till it seemed his skin was a suit of itching wool on him, that set the blood beating in his head as if his skull would burst. He kicked frantically at the door, turned his back on it, and pounded at it with his heel. His lungs were fighting with him for a breath of the deadly heat, and his head was reeling and his knees were weak. He knotted his muscles in one last gathering of his last strength, and, with a despairing kick, put his heel through the panel. He kicked it out clean with a weaker blow, fell forward on waters, dragged him across the boards, put the private's bare head through the opening, and lay down himself with his head on his arms at the mercy of the flames. Parr and Gallagher found them there unconscious, and took them out to the roof. They were carried down through the adjoining house, burned and blackened, but still alive. They were taken to the emergency ward of a hospital in the one ambulance. Their burns were dressed together, and they were put to bed in two cots, side by side. It was there that Pym dismissed the class in his select school of instruction two weeks later, when Waters was leaving the hospital, cured and the sergeant still lay, swathed like a mummy, in his cot. Waters had been trying to thank him without quite forgiving him for his truck-house persecution. Pym had put aside this clumsy show of gratitude with a pathetic half-smile that trembled between the burned bristle of his upper lip and the medicated cotton that covered his chin. "'I guess we gave you a bad two days down at the house,' he said in an old man's voice, thin and weak with illness. No harm done, eh? None meant. Well, good luck, Waters. Can't shake hands. They've got me in ten-ounce gloves. He spread his bandaged hands on the coverlet. Waters would not accept this dismissal. He said, reddening, I hope you'll be back at the house. Pym rolled his head on the pillow. No, he said slowly, I'm out. I'm down and out. They've got me on my back. 
That's right. They've got me down. It was the sum of two weeks of bitter reflection, two weeks of looking back on a life of disappointed hopes and lost ambitions. Waters, he said, you've got a pull. Use it. Use it for all it's worth. You'll have to crawl to a lot of dubs, but you have to do that in any business. It's the way to get on. I try the other way, and they get the laugh on you all right. Waters said, What you call a grafter? You roasted me good and hot on that. And it wasn't true, neither. I didn't graft. I was a fool, Pym said. I always was. If I had my life to live over... Well, I guess I'd do the same thing again. That's me. That's Jim Pym. But if you want the last word on Jim Pym, he's been a fool. Young and old, he's been a fool. Oh, I guess not, Waters said half-heartedly. Pym shook his head, but did not reply. Waters felt himself incapable of further consolation. He shifted his weight from foot to foot. He fumbled with his hat. Well, good-bye, he said huskily. Pym licked his dry lips. Good-bye, Waters, he whispered. Take care of yourself. End of chapter 7, part 1「Chapter Seven, Part Two of the Smoke Eaters by Harvey J. O'Higgins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Training Sally Waters, Part Two. Waters returned to duty on the last Friday in March. It was on the following Sunday that the Hansard building was burned. Early in the afternoon, a hurricane, predicted by the Weather Bureau, whirled up from the far southwest and struck the city with the back sweep of a northeast gale that drove the rain in sheets before it, scooped it up from the gutters, tossed it in waves against the houses, and carried it breast-high along the streets, cold, solid, and stinging, like small shot. At nightfall this rain ceased, and the wind, free of the weight of water, leaped forward to the velocity of a tornado. It was ten o'clock, when a policeman on Broadway, sheltering himself in a doorway from the storm, saw the light of flames dancing in the basement windows of a wholesale clothing house that stood on the street corner across the road. And he turned in an immediate alarm. Before the first engine companies could arrive, the sidewalk gratings were so many gridirons over a leaping fire. By the time the second alarm was answered, the whole ground floor was ablaze, and the heat had driven the pipemen back from the doors. With the third alarm, the flames burst from the roof in a stream of sparks that rose from the bellows draft of that gigantic forge, and danced in the wind up the north wall of the adjoining Hansard building, to the full height of its sixteen stories. Engines were ordered to connect with the standpipes of that building. Engine companies were rushed up the elevators with their hose to fight the fire from the windows. Truck companies were sent up with extra lines to assist them, and Company No. 0 followed last with orders to wet down the north wall from the roof. "'There's a fool job,' Captain Meaghan muttered. Corrigan and Waters reached the roof with the nozzle of a line of hose that was being laid from the standpipe of the top floor, and they came out into the night, dragging their length of line, to face a gale of wind that took the breath from between their teeth. They struggled against it, through the darkness, toward the light of fire over the parapet, and they looked down there, through the smoke, at the flames in the roof of the clothing-house twelve stories below them. Captain Meaghan, behind them, cried back to the other men, "'Start your water!' And in a moment a feeble stream swelled the line of hose and gushed from the pipe. He cursed it. "'It can't spit past its chin!' he shouted, in a passionate disgust that lifted his voice above the storm. The stream strengthened as they watched it. "'Keep wetting her down!' he shouted in Corrigan's ear. "'Get up another line!' he cried to the rest of the crew. The rushing of the wind drowned their answer, but they hurried below to obey him. He remained with Corrigan and Waters, watching the fire spread and brighten in the roof of the clothing-house, and Corrigan was still grinning at his can't spit past its chin. 
They were two hundred feet above the street level, and the storm, hurling itself across the huddled roofs below them, drew up a draught of heat and smoke to them as if they were looking down a chimney. They could guess what the heat must be in the street, for across the road the woodwork of the windows of a five-story building had caught fire without the touch of any flame, and a crew of pygmies were drenching it with a stream which they shot up straight from the sidewalk. Officers the size of mannequins ran up and down in the ruddy glow, waving their little arms. The fire flowed over the roof as if it were a burning oil, and the smoke came up to them thicker, and the heat more stifling with every breath. Their weak stream dribbled down the wall, to dry out on the hot bricks before it touched the point of danger, and Cargan leaned over the parapet to see that the paint was beginning to peel off in great scales far below. Waters and he tried hopelessly to reach these, by swinging the pipe from side to side. They might as well have tried to irrigate a desert with it. Their eyes were dry and beginning to smart. The rest of the crew came up again, dragging a second line. "'No use bringing more lines up here!' Captain Meaghan shouted to Gallagher. "'Windows will be breakin'. There ain't a shutter on the whole blamed buildin'. Fireproof. She's matchwood. Back down to the twelfth floor. Get lines stretched to the air-shaft there." The men went back with their hose. "'Do the best you can up here,' he advised Corrigan. "'Chief's orders to wet her down. Keep your eye open for that air-shaft.' Corrigan caught the first of these instructions, but the wind carried away that last warning of danger, and the captain turned and left the two men unconscious of the catastrophe that was preparing for them. The air-shaft, in fact, was acting as a sheltered flue for the flames. It cut a deep groove in the wall of the Hansard building at Corrigan's left, and the wind, rushing into it, rose straight aloft, blowing up sparks like the cupola of a blast-furnace. Corrigan, watching only the wall and windows below him, pitied the crews at work in the street. He was wishing for a quid of chewing tobacco, and he remembered with exasperation that Waters would have none. That was one of Waters's social limitations. He did not chew. It was also one of the reasons why Corrigan disliked him. They had been fellow probationers at fire headquarters, and the instructor, having pitted them against each other in a race with scaling ladders, had publicly compared Corrigan to a baby hippopotamus in point of nimbleness, because Waters had run away from him. After they had joined Company No. 0, Corrigan had found Waters's conversation all hot air and free silver, and had quarrelled with him about this wearisome enthusiasm for politics. Consequently, there was no friendship between them, and they continued stolidly at work, now, in the silence of mutual indifference. The growing strength of the stream threatened to tear the nozzle from their hands, and they raised the hose to their shoulders to bend it in a swan's neck arch that sent the water hissing down the bricks. They were busied so, when they saw a bluish-green flame flash in the red of the fire in the roof below, and a belch of smoke rolled up to them on the echo of an explosion. Before it reached them they heard another roar beneath it. The cloud of smoke was split with flame, and they jumped back from the parapet as if from the crater of a volcano and threw themselves on their faces, as the burning gases, freed by the collapse of the roof, flared two hundred feet in the air, and licking up the side of the Hansard building, to break every window-glass in its upper ten stories and ignite every window-curtain, window-sash and trim in its north wall, rolled over them in a heat that nipped their ears like a frostbite and was gone. Corrigan pinned down the pipe that was threshing about on the roof and staggered back to the parapet with it. The beat of heat was unendurable, and he could see nothing for the smoke that blinded him with tears. He did not know that the gale was carrying a solid tongue of fire into the hidden air-shaft, and that every window on that shaft was already spitting flames. He could just see that the woodwork of the window below him was afire, and he called Waters to train the pipe on it with him. They doused it black at once, and scattered the smoke to see another blaze below. Then the stream from their hose weakened and fell short, and it was plain that the crews were using the water on the lower floors. 
** We're wanted down below, I guess," Waters said. ** We're no good up here now." Corrigan nodded. They shut off the nozzle and turned to drag the line to the door of the stairs. They were too late. Corrigan saw the blaze in the air shaft and cried out an oath. That shaft, he knew, lit the stairway from the ground up and cut them off from the elevator shaft in the center of the building. They dropped the line and ran to the door. Smoke was pouring from it, and flame was behind the smoke. Corrigan ran back for the hose, and with the water to open the way for him, fought down three steps into a blaze that could not be faced. The wind, blowing in the broken windows of the air shaft, brought up a smother of heat and smoke against which his pipe was useless. He was fighting a prairie fire with the stream of an extinguisher. Waters pitched forward on his shoulders. Corrigan braced himself against the weight, turned to catch Waters under the armpits, and carried him up, himself half suffocated, and laid him on the roof. They were greeted by the fierce purring of the flames. Waters groaned. "'You all right?' Corrigan asked him. He rolled his eyes. "'Let's get down out of here,' he gasped. Corrigan straightened up and looked around him. The doorway was the only entrance to the roof. He walked back to kick the useless hose down the staircase so that he might shut the tin-sheathed door on the blaze below. He went to the stone railing that surmounted the cornice on the front of the building. The coping overhung the windows in a sheer drop to the street. He hurried to the south wall. The windows there were twelve feet down, and there was no pipe, no foothold. He went to the back of the roof and found another coping. He turned and watched Waters running from parapet to parapet, now hidden in a cloud of whirling smoke, now black in the red glow of wind-blown flames. He saw him lean over the marble railing of the front cornice and put his hands in a trumpet to his mouth. He saw him take off his helmet and try to throw it down into the street, and the gale snatched it from his hand, tossed it aloft, and blew it away to the south with the smoke and the flying embers. He came running back to Corrigan. "'Let's get down,' he panted. "'Let's get down.' Corrigan did not reply. "'For the Lord's sake, Corrigan,' he cried, "'don't let's burn alive up here.' Corrigan shook his head. "'I can't get down,' he said. He could see that there was nothing on the roof to burn. The heat, and not the flame, would be their danger. The fire was at its worst in the light well. At the point farthest from it, there was a huge water tank, protected with a covering of tin, and supported across the angle of the walls on steel beams. Even if the roof should fall, the tank would not go with it. They would have water to prevent the heat from baking them to death. They would have the tank to shelter them from the drift of smoke. Corrigan went over to it and crouched down to peer under the beams. Waters stumbled against him. Say, he whimpered, I can't, I can't get down. Corrigan pushed him aside impatiently. Well, who said you could? he snarled. You're up here to stay. You better make up your mind to that and shut your yap. Waters threw up his arms and screamed at the sky in a high, dry voice, clutching with his fingers and snapping like a dog with his teeth. Then he pitched forward into the smoke on a run for the street parapet again. Corrigan climbed slowly up the iron ladder to the top of the tank. He came on a scuttle there and raised it, to find that the tank was almost full. He took off his rubber coat and dipped it down, and it came up dripping. He rubbed it over his face, and licked at the moisture on the smooth tarpaulin. And the touch of water sent a burning fever flush of thirst through him. He reached back with his helmet, drew it up half full, and emptied it over his head and down his back, again and again. Then he drank in great gulps, sighing with satisfaction. The relief brought back his energies. The tank ladder took his eye, and it occurred to him that if he could get it loose he might be able to reach a lower window with it. He took hold of it in his great hands, drew a long breath, and strained to wrench it from its iron sockets, tightening on it slowly until the blood drummed in his ears. He bent the upright of it, but the socket still held it. When he paused for breath, he remembered Waters and shouted to him for aid. He got no answer, and he descended to the roof 
to find Waters lying in the worst of the heat that blew from the air shaft. He dragged him back from it and emptied a helmet full of water on his face. Waters rolled his head from side to side, muttering to himself. "'Look here,' Corrigan said. "'Look a-here!' Waters opened staring eyes, moving his lips in a whisper. "'Better get up to the tank and take a dip. I want you to help get that ladder loose.' Waters slipped an arm about Corrigan's neck, raising himself on his elbow. "'Get me down out of this,' he whispered. "'Get me down out of this, and I'll make it good. I got a pull. I got a promise.' Corrigan threw off his arm. "'Stop talking foolish. I can't get you down. Here, take a drink.' Waters caught at his collar, knocking aside the water. "'Get me down,' he said huskily. "'You get me down, Corrigan. I'll make it good. I'm right in with the gang. Dorgan said—' Corrigan threw him off with a curse. "'I can't get you down,' he yelled at him. "'What the blank's the matter with you, you blank, blank, blank?' Waters fell back and lay breathing hard, with open mouth. A puff of smoke blew down and choked him with a sob. Corrigan dragged him across the roof to the tank, and sat down beside him, uncertain what to do, with his back to the parapet and his face to the light well. The heat swam over them in a suffocating current. Waters threw out his arms and lay as if stretched on a cross, rolling his head from side to side, agonized and speechless. He began to mumble the confession of a Roman Catholic, beating his breast with a whispered, "'Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault!' Corrigan scowled. The smoke irritated him. The heat pricked him. "'Can't you shut your yap for half a minute?' he complained. Waters groaned. He asked in a hoarse whisper, "'Do you think there's any hell?' Corrigan laughed. "'Ah, oh, cut it out!' he said. "'You're scared. That's all that's wrong with you.' There was a crash of breaking windows in the air shaft. The flames roared up, flapping like a banner in the wind. "'Help!' Waters screeched. "'Help! Help!' Corrigan clapped a hand over his mouth and silenced him. "'Well, you lobster!' "'Aw, oh, don't!' he pleaded. "'Don't!' Corrigan stood up in the thickening smoke and looked down at him. "'Look a here,' he said. "'If you got any wind to spare, you'd better save it for your prayers. This roof's going to drop you in a hole so hot it won't leave enough of you for hell to raise a blister on. Shut up, will ya?' He turned away from him angrily, and climbed the ladder to the top of the tank, so that he might sit down there in quiet. He could hear the engines in the street whistling frantically for coal from the fuel wagons, and they sounded very far away. He reached down into the scuttle and drank from his helmet again. The air came up cool from the tank. He lay with his face in the draught of it, and shut his dry eyelids on his aching eyes. Although he had threatened Waters with the collapse of the roof, he had spoken in anger to terrify him into silence and not because he believed that either of them would lose his life. He was not a man of imagination, and his breath was too strong in his body for him to realize the possibility of death. If the crew below could not find some means of reaching them, he hoped to live out the fire where he was. Chiefly he was angry, and bewildered by his own anger, because Waters had gone to pieces and made such a noise. He could not think. The heat was wearing on him, he lay there, waiting. And in fact, the crew below were already planning to reach him. Captain Meaghan had been so busy, trying to keep the flames on the twelfth floor from forcing their way from the air shaft to the elevator well, that he did not think of the two men whom he had left on the roof. It was not until sparks and burning embers began to pour down the elevator well from the upper stories that the possibility of their situation occurred to him. He called two of his crew to get scaling ladders, and, leaving Gallagher in charge of the pipes, he ran to the southwest end of the building, to the farthest from the fire, and opening a window there, looked up. He could see no signs of fire showing in any of the windows above him. "'Looks all right,' he said to the men, "'but you'll have to be quick. Keep your eyes open for the windows below as you go up.' 
They had a coil of lifeline and two ladders. They used but one of the latter, going up together for greater speed, one man holding the other on the sill by the snap-hook of his life-belt, while he, standing upright on the window-sill, had both his hands free to raise the ladder. This made it necessary to break in the lower sash of each window with their hatchets, and at the first window they saw the wisdom of Megan's warning. The room was stifling with heat and smoke, and as soon as they opened a vent into it the fire showed in the darkness. At the fourteenth story a light of flames was already glimmering behind the broken pane. The smoke poured out on them as they beat in the glass and hauled up the ladder. They went ahead, however, and while they were climbing up the wall from that window, they heard a cry below them and looked down to see the flames in the thirteenth story cutting them off. A shout of warning from Captain Meaghan was followed by a faint call from above them. They looked up and saw Corrigan peering over the edge of the water tank. Meaghan shouted, "'Come down the rope!' They looked down to see him waving to them. They looked up, and Corrigan had disappeared. The upper man said, "'We can't reach him!' They delayed for a moment, a moment that was almost fatal, for, while they hesitated, the fire burst out in the fourteenth story also. Then they tied the end of their rope around the shaft of the ladder. Each took a twist of it in the hook of his belt. They dropped. They slid down through the fire and smoke, blistered and blinded, to Captain Meaghan, who caught each as he came, and drew him in the window. A fireman, sent by Lieutenant Gallagher, came up shouting, "'Fire's at the elevator shaft!' They turned and ran. Corrigan had gone down to the roof to get waters, and found him lying on his face on the bricks. "'The men are coming up the ladders,' he said. Waters sprang to his feet with this new hope of life, and followed him around the tank to the parapet. And they looked down on the empty ladder, twenty feet below them, hanging in the flames with a blazing rope dangling from it into the smoke. "'Hell!' Corrigan said, disgustedly. Waters stared at the abandoned apparatus. "'I guess,' he said in a new voice. He turned back with Corrigan to the front of the tank again. There was a lull in the wind. The smoke and the flames rose up straight on all sides of them, and the bricks were warm under their feet. There was no escape now. "'We got a half a chance left,' Corrigan said. "'We can get in the tank.' Waters shook his head. "'No use. I got to cash in, I guess.' Corrigan cursed him. "'Well, I ain't,' he shouted. "'Get a hold of this ladder.' He braced himself, with a foot against the tin covering of the tank, bent his back, and tugged to loosen the ladder from its fastenings. Waters helped him. They strained and struggled with all the strength of every muscle, and the great screws in the sockets of the uprights came out slowly. Once the ladder had loosened its hold, they levered it, twisted it, and wrenched it free. Corrigan crawled under the steel beams and turned off the stopcock there. Then they both climbed aloft, lowered the ladder into the tank, and slid down, one on each side of the rungs, into the water. They drank together, sunk to the teeth. Corrigan ducked. "'You'd better tie yourself on,' he sputtered. "'We'll be eatin' smoke here before long.' The scuttle was a red square of light above them, and they could see each other's faces as pale blurs of no recognizable feature in the darkness. They stripped off their upper clothing, and bound themselves under their arms to the ladder. They could hear the crackle and roar of flames outside. There was a pecking of scattered rain on the tin above them. "'I wish I'd something to eat,' Corrigan said. Waters sighed. "'I'd like something to breathe better.' He was choking with heat and smoke. He rested his chin on a rung of the ladder. He was tired and dizzy. He seemed to be drifting on clouds of smoke, blown about in the storm and heat, a glowing spark above the flames. He heard Corrigan's voice at a great distance saying, "'Wind changed. South!' The Hansard building had caught fire at 10.45 o'clock. At midnight, the chief, fearing the effect of heat and water on the steel framework, ordered all the companies to back down to the tenth floor and leave the six upper stories to burn themselves out. They burned all night, 
the flames lighting the city like a huge torch held aloft above the houses. It was feared that the floors might fall and bring the roof with them. But the steel columns, girders, and floor beams had all been built around and protected with terracotta furring, the walls lined with wire lath and plaster, and the floor arches built of hard-burned terracotta blocks. There was nothing in the rooms to burn except the office furniture and the woodwork of bases, chair rails, doors, windows, and floors. Daybreak found the building still standing, a smoking and blackened shell above the tenth story, with the firemen putting out the last smoulder in the gutted rooms. They fought their way up slowly from floor to floor, until by noon Captain Meaghan and a squad of his company, looking for their dead, reached the stairs leading to the roof. They found there the blackened nozzle which Corrigan had abandoned to the fire. They went upstairs, hopelessly, and burst open the door, and saw Corrigan himself, red-eyed and dripping, and stripped to the waist, sitting on the edge of the tank, beating with his heels on its sides, and singing crazy nothings in the voice of insanity. Captain Meaghan went over to him and called up, "'Where's Waters?' He winked and pointed down into the tank. "'I'm king of the castle,' he chanted. "'I'm king of the castle. I'm the—' "'What? What's Waters? Little Sally Waters? Oh, he's a spellbinder,' he said with a grin. "'He's a spellbinder, talkin' hot air. Comin' up? Come on up. It ain't as hot up here as it was.' And they found Waters, unconscious but alive, still tied to the ladder, and floating with his head between the rungs. Some weeks later, when ex-Sergeant Pym, retired on half-pay on account of his injuries, was making a social call on his old friends in the truck-house, he thought to ask for Waters. "'Him?' Gallagher said. "'Oh, he's quit the department. He's going to join the police.' End of chapter 7, part 2